Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we are going to look at the acceptability of the population using monetary unit sampling. Now, this is a part three of, of, a, sesh, uh, of a series of uh, monetary unit sampling. So I already completed part one, completed part two. So if you just stumbled upon this recording, you want to go, you want to go back to my playlist, look under complete auditing course and view part one and part two before we get to part three. So you understand what we did earlier, how, how we found the sample size, basically an introduction of monetary unit sampling. How does it work here? We're going to make a decision, make a decision if we should accept or not accept the balance. And this is what, why we are doing this. We are doing monetary unit sampling to test account balances. It's a part of variable, uh, variable testing. Do we accept the balance as fairly stated or if it's not fairly stated? So to start, we're going to work at an example to see how this works. So let's assume we're dealing with a population of account receivable of $1.2 million. So that's the, the population we are working with. The sample size happens to be 100. So this is already calculated for us. We have a whole session on how we came up with the sample size. Now the sample interval, could you compute the sample interval? I hope you know what the sample interval is. It's the population divided by the sample. This is called the sampling interval. And why is this important? What does the sample interval tells us? It says any, any balance above 12,000, it's gonna be audited, 100% audited. So this is the sampling interval. For the purpose of this example, we're gonna be working with the acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance of 5% or we are confidence, our confidence level is 95%. If you don't know what this is, Go back and view the prior session. So we went out there, we collected 100 samples, 100 samples, uh, 100 uh, account 100 items of from account receivable, and we find the error equal to zero. Good, is this good news? Of course it's good news. Uh, do we automatically accept? No, we don't automatically accept, why not? Remember, we only looked at a sample size of 100. We did not look at the whole population because we sampled, we still have to compute. So what is our actual, so, so let, let's think about it. What is our actual error? Actual error equal to zero. We did not find any errors, okay? So can we project the Can we project zero to the population where if we saying this, this sample is a representative is a true representation of the population. Therefore, basically, it's the projected is also zero. But because we sampled, we still have, we are still taking a risk. So what happened, we have to compute something called the upper misstatement bound, or just the bound, or the misstatement bound, or the upper misstatement bound. How do we compute the upper misstatement bound? The way we compute this, the formula is you take the sampling interval, sampling, interval and you multiply by what we called the confidence uh, the confidence level confidence not level confidence factor cf confidence factor okay so we know the sampling interval is 12000 we're going to compute this uh, we're going to compute this by the confidence factor now what do we need to do we need to go to a table to give us the confidence factor and this is the 5% we are dealing with a 5% acceptable risk of over uh, of uh, not over reliance this is for internal control uh, um, acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance not reliance and we found zero error number of misstatement is zero therefore the number equal to three so we're going to take twelve thousand and multiply twelve thousand by three and that's going to give us thirty six thousand what does that mean it means although we found no error we still have to compute the upper misstatement bound it means we could be wrong, the, 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 the account could be misstated by 36,000, okay? Although we found no error, we still, because we sampled. When no errors is found, this number is called basic precision, okay? So basically it's for sampling risk, because we're sampling, therefore we compute this. So this is the how we compute the upper misstatement bound. Now, how do we make, usually, how do we make a decision? How do, how do we make a decision if we should accept or not? Well, this is how we make a decision. Let me just show you the formula or how it works. Then we, we, I, I, I'll show you uh, an example. The auditor compares the calculated misstatement bound to the tolerable misstatement. Okay, so basically we're going to compare the misstatement bound, the upper misstatement bound. In our situation, we, it happens to be 36. 
To the tolerable misstatement, hopefully we all know what the tolerable misstatement is. Now in this example that we just worked, I did not tell you what the tolerable misstatement, but simply put, if the tolerable misstatement is 50,000, we're in good shape. Okay, because in the upper misstatement down is 36 and we can tolerate the 50, we're good. Let's assume the tolerable misstatement is only 10,000. Then although we found no error, there's an issue because when we computed the tolerable misstatement, it was higher than uh, when we when we computed the upper misstatement down, it's higher than the tolerable misstatement. So if the bound exceeds the tolerable misstatement, the population is not considered acceptable. So simply put, let me just show you what I mean by this. Let me maybe if you see it in a graph, this is zero. This is the tolerable misstatement. And what happened is this. What is the actual error? Actual error for this example was zero. We did not find any actual error. Therefore, if there's no actual error, we cannot project it. But what's going to happen, we're going to add to the actual error uh, the upper misstatement bound. And the upper misstatement down happened to be 36. I'm going to assume the tolerable misstatement is 50. Under, this circumst under these circumstances, we say the account is good because the upper bound misstatement or the upper bound or the upper misstatement bound is 36,000 below the tolerable misstatement okay and the actual error was zero so we were lucky if the actual error was something you know like 5,000 then we have to project then we have to add the upper misstatement so we'll look we'll look at an example anyway but this is if we found no errors this is if we found no errors okay so when no misstatements are found of the entire so generalizing from the sample where no misstatements are found. If the entire sample is audited and no misstatements are found in the sample, the audit can conclude that the recorded amount of the, of the population is not overstated by more than the tolerable misstatement at that specific risk of incorrect acceptance. Okay, so the upper limit when no misstatements are found in the confidence fact uh, is the confidence factor for no misstatement multiplied by the length of the sampling interval. This is what we did with the 12,000, and it happens to be three. And we call this because no misstatements are found we call it basic precision now we're going to change the situation and let's assume misstatements are found okay when misstatements are found so when we found when now we found misstatements assume the auditor tested the sample and found three misstatements three overstatement which is three misstatements calculate the upper misstatement bound so we're going to be three steps to calculate the upper misstatement bound so let's take a look at those three steps first we calculate the percentage misstatement for each misstatement so we need to know what the what the misstatement is and the percentage of that account we're going to see at this two we're going to project the sample misstatement by multiplying the percentage misstatement by the length of the interval then step three we're going to add an allowance for sampling risk based on the confidence factor for the actual number of misstatement and the accept acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance so the best way to do this is to actually look at an example to see how this works. So let's take a look at those three errors that we found. Okay, so three errors. The first error is customer number 2073. The account balance recorded on the books, recorded account balance is 6,200. We audited the account, it's 6,100. The actual factual misstatement is $100. This is the actual misstatement. And what is the misstatement as a percentage? as a percent well if we take 100 divided it by 6200 is 0.016 then we have customer number 5111 the recorded amount of receivable is 12910 the audited balance is 12000 the factual misstatement is 910 now we don't compute a percentage for this number why not because any any account above 12000 we examine them all so we, we we're not going to need to project an error on that group therefore this is not applicable so we don't compute a percentage a misstatement for any account above the interval and the interval happens to be 12,000 okay customer number three 9816 that's the that's the customer number the recorded account receivable is 8947 the audited amount was 2947 big mistake a six thousand dollar factual misstatement if we take six thousand dollar divided by the uh, recorded amount it's 67.1 this is a huge percentage uh, uh, misstatement huge 
67%. Now, this is the first step to find the percent misstatement. Okay, we'll take the misstatement divided by the recorded amount. We're not done yet because those are the actual, actual, actual finding, what we find out. The next thing we do, we are going to project them. So now when misstatements are found, the auditor calculate a projected misstatement and an allowance for sampling risk. So in addition to the, to the actual error, we're going to project the error to the group, then add an allowance for sampling risk. Okay, so let's first project the sample misstatement. So the projected misstatement is the percentage of misstatement, which is the, that's why we calculated those percentages, times the sampling interval. Okay, the calculation, we're going to see this in the next slide. So here's what's going to happen. This is what we did earlier. This is what we did earlier. We did up to this point. We went through column A, B, C, and D. So we found the actual or factual misstatement. So actually we found in the sample $7,010 in errors. This is what we actually found, and those are the percentages. And one more thing, when you're doing this, you want to make sure you rank the percentages from the highest to the lowest. So 67 comes before 1.6. And remember, for this group, there is no percentage for the $12,000 amount. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to project the error. We're going to project the error to that, to that group. So we're going to take the percentage that we computed times the interval. And that's going to give us the projected misstatement. Okay, so if we take 67.1% times 12,000, the projected misstatement is 8,052. Okay, although we found 6,000, but we project the find uh, 8,052. Again, for the $100, we're going to take the $100, uh, for the $100 factual misstatement, the rate is 1.6. We're going to multiply it by 12%. The projected is 192. So what does this $9,154 represent? This represents the factual, what we actually found, plus the projected. So what you need to do, you need to, the factual is... The factual is 7,000, but the projected misstatement is 9,154. Are we done yet? Are we done yet? No, not yet, because remember, we have to add allowance for sampling risk because we are sampling. We're going to even go further. So what do we do next? We are going to take the projected misstatement and multiply it by some sort of a confidence factor. Now, how do you come up with this confidence factor? Well, remember, there's a table, and for the table, we need to use, make sure you're using, this is a 5% risk of incorrect risk of incorrect acceptance. And we found one error. The first error, it's going to be multiplied by the incremental change, 1.75. And the second overstatement, we have we have three, but one of them we don't we don't project, multiplied by 1.55. And this is being conservative. That's why we, we, we rank them the highest comes first. Highest comes first means what? It means the higher the percentage, the higher it's going to be the, um, uh, the sampling error. Okay, so let's go back up here. Now we're going to take 8,052 times 1.75. So the projected misstatement plus the projected misstatement plus the incremental allowance for sampling risk. Why did we add this much? We added more. We took the projected misstatement and add basically 0.75 to it. That's what we did. We added 0.75. Why? Because we're sampling. And as we're sampling, there's a risk of being wrong. So therefore, we want to be conservative. That's why we add this um, this uh, this allowance for risk. And we'll take $192, which is a small, not, not large, multiplied by 1.55 gives us 298. Now, what does this number represent 15,299 dollars okay that's basically the factual it include the factual the projected plus the incremental risk we're not done yet what we do we add to that 15,299 the basic precision 36,000 and this is how we found our upper misstatement bound this is how we found our upper misstatement bound. This is how we found our upper misstatement bound. So let me show it to you on basically on a graph. Okay, so here's what we did. First, um, 
and then make it maybe if I can make it a little bigger be better okay there we go so here we go first we found factual misstatement of let's assume this is seven thousand and ten dollars so this box represents seven thousand and ten dollars that when we do we add to it the projected misstatement so we're going to add to this the projected misstatement so let's see the difference between let me see how much was the projected misstatement by itself 9154 minus 7010 so we add it to this 2144 this is the 2144 2144 so this is the factual this is the projected and together they're at 9,000 9 together are 9,000 uh, 9,154 then we add to them the sample of increment inc incremental risk we add it to them this 15,000 we add it to them 15,299 then we add to them let's assume this is 36,000 the precision uh, the basic precision now how do we make the decision well we have to find out where does our tolerable misstatement line uh, wh where is the tolerable misstatement line so all in all all in all if we add all of them they add up to this up here is we use a different color here up here all of them combined together is 51,299 right it's this number now it all depends about your tolerable misstatement if your tolerable misstatement if your tolerable misstatement if your tolerable misstatement is this line here which is below the 52,000 then you would you would reject because uh, the upper misstatement is more than the tolerable misstatement okay which is around what around 40,000 here okay if your tolerable misstatement is someplace here like if your tolerable misstatement is $75,000 now you would accept the population because you added the factual mistake the projected mistake the sampling risk and the and the basic precision and you still did not exceed the tolerable misstatement so it all depends on where does your tolerable misstatement line lies basically so hopefully through this picture you saw what we are what we are doing um, another way to look at it basically um, if you want to look at it in another way I'll sh just show it to you one more time in another way um, okay so basically the factual brought you up to 7010 the projected increased it a little bit the sampling risk increased the graph a little bit and adding the basic precision it brought it up it brought it up here now we're looking at this does this graph exceeds the tolerable misstatement or does not exceed the tolerable misstatement if it exceeds the tolerable misstatement is this if this graph here exceeds the tolerable misstatement you reject if the tolerable misstatement it's still higher than the because this represent the upper misstatement bound okay so this is how we make a decision I hope that uh, um this makes sense when you show it when you see it on a graph but this is exactly what we are doing here if you have any questions any comments by all means email me or see me in class and if you're studying for your cpa exam study hard it's worth it in the next session i might just work an example to reinforce what we just did in those three sessions good luck and uh, study hard